before we do all this, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy word. It is you yourself who have breathed it out, and it is unchanging and perfect as you are unchanging and perfect. And you have not left us in the dark, but your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And your word is how we are able to keep um, our ways pure. Help us to have a a desire for your word. And I thank you that you've already given us a desire for your word, which is why we're here. But as deep as our desire is now, Lord, please make it deeper still. Give us a love for your word. Help us to live our lives by your word. Help everything we think, say, and do be guided by your word. Give us wisdom and understanding through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. As we study your word tonight, Lord, uh, help mold us and shape us and encourage us through your word so that we might be more like Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. You'll notice that the subtitle to Romans 9 is God's Sovereign Choice. So we'll read through all of it and then we'll uh, go through it verse at a time and break it down. This is Paul speaking. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But, quote, through Isaac shall your offspring be named, end quote. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, quote, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son, end quote. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sands of the sea, 
only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is, a righteousness that is by faith? But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching the law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying as, uh, in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's Romans 9. And now we read through it once all together, and now we'll break it down and go chunk through it here. I remind you, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Question 1. Read verses 1 through 3. Okay. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. So what is he not lying about? Uh, he says he's speaking the truth. He's not lying. He has a clear conscience about what he's about to say. And what he's about to say that he has a clear conscience about and that he's not lying about comes right in verse 2 and 3. He says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. So Paul is speaking truthfully that he has great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart. Why? Verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So what is... What is Paul saying there? What is it he's wishing is possible in verses 2 and 3? He's distressed over the fate of his fellow Jews. So what is it he wishes he could do for them? He wishes that he could take his pla their place. I wish I myself were accursed. I wish they had faith and that I was accursed. I wish I was cut off from Christ so that they could be connected to Christ. Is, what, is, is that wish, you understand what he's wishing for, right? Perhaps you've had a similar sentiment. Maybe you've ever been walking uh, through a store and you see a, a, young, a young one and they're in a, a wheelchair or they're struggling with, uh, with uh, a cane or, or you just see them in, in great distress and your heart goes out to them and you go, oh, I wish I could take their pain for them. It's that kind of sentiment, right? Oh, I wish I could take their place, Right? And that's the sentiment Paul's expressing here, except he's talking about salvation. He's talking about faith. So is what Paul's wishing for there, is that possible? Is it possible for you or me to say, I give up my salvation so that person A can be saved in, instead? Is that possible? No. no. You're right. It's not possible. Why is it not? First off, your hint that it's not possible is we, for I could wish, right? I wish it was possible. I wish that it was possible. So that's your hint in verse three, right? That it's not possible. Why is it not possible? Because you're right. It's not possible. But there's a reason why it's not possible. You can't lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation. God's the one that decides. God's the one that decides. These are good answers. Why else? I'll give you another reason besides the ones that you guys, the good ones that you've given already, and it is this. I can't save anyone. You can't save anyone. My life is not an acceptable sacrifice for someone's salvation, is it? As we've already seen earlier in Romans, there is only one sacrifice that is effective for the forgiveness of sins and for the imputation of righteousness. Only one, and that is Jesus Christ. I cannot, if I said, God, I give myself so that my nephew can be saved. I give myself so my nephew can be saved. God would say, that's not how it works. You're not a worthy sacrifice. I'd have to be perfect. I'd have to be righteous. And am I perfect and am I righteous? No. no. There is only one adequate sacrifice. That's why this is not possible. 
even if somebody has the, the will to go through with this and say, I will give up my eternity in, 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 in so that this person can have eternity. It's not possible because God decides and because it has to come through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and faith in that sacrifice. Does that make sense? It's a much better answer. <laughs> well, it, it's a, it completes the answer, doesn't it? It brings everything full circle. So you understand that this isn't just, well, if God was more loving, if he loved this person as much as I would, as much as I do, see, it has nothing to do with that. And so it, it brings the answer full circle. So we feel good about verses one through three? All right. Very good. And also, you know, in some translations, it's, uh, I wish that I myself were accursed, right? I wish that I was damned. Accursed means anathema or damned. So he's literally saying, I wish that I could give up my salvation so that they wouldn't be damned. But that's not possible. But it does give you a glimpse as to how Paul feels, right? And we can, we can, we understand his heart. He, he really, he really is distressed here. He is grieved for his fellow Jews. All right, so let's move on. Question two. What benefits and privileges did the Israelites have that Paul lists in verses four and five? Let me read verses four and five. They are Israelites. So just in case you have any question about who Paul was talking about, it's the Israelites, his brothers, the Israelites. And to them, the Israelites belong the adoption. You can just underline these as the answers, right? Adoption, the glory the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises, the patriarchs. And from, from their race, from the Israelites, comes Christ. Those are all the benefits and the privileges that belong to Israel as God's chosen people. They, they, are, they have, um, in a sense, God has put out the welcome for them to join his family through adoption. Uh, the glory, they got to experience God's presence. So they've experienced God's presence, that's the glory. They, they have been able to enter into a relationship with him, that's the covenants. They received his law, that's God's revelation to them. They've got to worship God and serve him in the temple. And they inherit blessings, which are the promises. This is, this is all the benefits and the privileges that were available to the Israelites. Did they take full advantage of all these things? No. 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 Any questions about verses 4 and 5? All right. Let's move on then. Oh, you know what? I did miss some. The, the patriarchs too, right? So that's Adam, or excuse me, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through whom all the tribes descended. That's the patriarchs, or the, the forefathers. All right, now we can move on. Question three, read verses six through eight. What do all these verses mean? And why is Paul bringing all this up? Well, let's find out. Let's read verses six through eight. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Ooh, interesting, interesting. This is getting a little deep. Let's go verse at a time. Verse 6. Paul, is, I'm going to read verse 6. And then the question is, why is Paul saying this? He says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. Why is Paul saying that? Why is Paul saying in the beginning of verse 6, it's not like the word of God has failed. What have we read from verses 1 through 5 that would cause Paul to say that? Because everything is gone exactly the way that God planned through Isaac. Yes, that's, that's why God's word hasn't failed. But why is he bringing that up in the first place? You're, 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 on, you're the correct answer to the second part of the question. Because I'm looking for the first part. They believe. They believe that the Messiah hasn't come. So if Paul is saying, look, the Bible hasn't failed, he has a reason to tell them that God's word hasn't failed. And it's because 
there, he is going to, he has just said, what? I wish I could lose my salvation so that you could have it. So he's talking about how some Jews do not have salvation. Some Jews, even though they had all the promises, even though they had the service, the law, the forefathers, the glory, the access to God, his presence, they had all these things, the revelation of his word, they had all these blessings and all these promises, yet some of them are still unsaved, which is the main point of what Paul said in verses 1 through 3, which is why he's saying, I wish that you were all saved and that I could give up my salvation so that you could be saved. And you've had all these promises and all these, all these blessings that have been given to you. And then right after he's done saying that, he makes the point, it is not as though the word of God has failed, though. So that's what comes to Jill's point, because that's the right, that then, see what I'm saying? So this is why Paul said that. He said that because, look, because some of God's people that he called, that, that he had, he gave, the call came to all of Israel, but the effective call only came to some. Not all Jews are saved. Not all Jews believe. And because of that, even though they had all these promises and all these blessings given to them, still there are some who do not believe. But because they do not believe, that does not mean that God's word failed. Okay? So that's why he's saying that. Then he goes on. And this is where Jill's answer comes in. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So not everyone who was an Israelite is going to be a spiritual child of God. Not everyone who was born through the lineage of Abraham is going to be saved spiritually, even though flesh-wise they came from Abraham. Spiritually, they're not of Abraham. And that's the point he's going to continue to make. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not, not all Israelites will be saved. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his physical offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So just to, just, this will help if I explain verse 8 first, and then we go back to verse 7. It is not the children of the flesh. Just because you were born in the flesh and you could trace yourself back to Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham does not mean you're automatically saved. It's not about your lineage, physically speaking, your fleshly lineage. It is not the children of the flesh who are considered children of God, which is another way of saying that you're saved. To be a child of God is to be saved. And so it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but it's the children of the promise who are counted uh, as his offspring. Many Jews appeal to their lineage, to Abraham, as their reason for them being saved. And this is proof positive that lineage has nothing to do with it. Your physical lineage has nothing to do with it. You, in modern terms, just because your mom and dad are believers doesn't mean that you're going to be saved. Yep. You know what I'm saying? That would be the, the modern equivalent. Same idea. <clears throat> Now we have where he's talking about Isaac, right? He talks about Isaac there. Jill, repeat your answer that you gave earlier. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Not all those who are true children of Abraham through Isaac are spiritual children, right? Abraham had one child of promise and he had other children that were not children of promise. He's, he's saying that the child of faith is the one who was his true spiritual descendant. In the same idea, those who are children of faith are spiritual descendants of Abraham. Not merely children by flesh, but children by faith. And Isaac was a child by faith. And he is who the promise of Jesus Christ came through, isn't it? And so that, that is why he's brought up there. That's why it's brought up like that. Not all people are, not all Israelites, not all Jews are children of Abraham because they're his offspring. Sure, you might be a fleshly offspring, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about salvation. But through Isaac, through faith, shall your offspring be named. 
your spiritual offspring. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise, or the children of faith, are counted as God's children, as his true offspring. Does that, does that make sense? Are we, are we clear that just because someone can trace their lineage back to Abraham, that through the flesh, that that does not save them? And that goes to, for today, that goes back in the time of the writing of this. People, the Jews were very, very, I'm a Jew, I'm a son of Abraham, therefore I'm a child of God and I'm saved. I live however I want. Because nothing can change the fact that I'm a, a fleshly descendant of Abraham and the word says that all of Abraham's descendants will be saved, right? That's what they really were counting on. Not on faith, not on obedience or trust, not at all, but on their flesh, on their connection to Abraham. And so this is not everybody who is a physical descendant is going to be an inheritor of the promise. Just like not all of Abraham's children inherited the promise, did they? Spiritually speaking, but Isaac did. And it's the same idea. There are some who are saved and there are some who are not saved. Those who inherit the promise, they'll be saved, but they're saved through faith spiritually, not through some kind of flesh connection or descendants. Any questions? It's a good thing. Because it is a very good thing. Like any of us in here. To our, knowledge, we, to our knowledge, none of us know, and probably not, uh, descendants of Abraham, right? And so, yes, uh, Isaac was the promise born to Abraham through his wife, Sarah. God fulfilled his promise to Abraham through Isaac. That's why it's a child of the promise. He had other sons, but his promise was fulfilled through Isaac. His faith promise fulfilled through Isaac. That's, that's the linkage here. That we're talking about faith, we're talking about spiritual, and we're not talking about flesh. Because he had other children of the flesh. But he only had one child of promise. That's the idea here. If, you, if you're a tr spiritually speaking to be a child of Abraham is to be a child of faith. Anyone who is a child of faith is considered a descendant of Abraham, spiritually speaking. You're, you and I are Abraham's spiritual children, even though we probably are not Jewish. Okay? So... Being another important part is that that means being a child of God depends on God's faithfulness to his promise, not on your physical descendants. And there's a there's there's going to be a principle there, right? Your ability to call yourself a child of God depends on your faith and God's faithfulness to his promise, not to physical things. Right. There'll be a principle there that we see as we go on. Question four. Read verses 9 through 13. Okay. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So, let's go through these verse at a time. Um, verse 9. What, what promise is verse 9 referring to there? What, say that again? Yeah, for this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return and Sarah will have a son. And the son that she was going to have is Isaac. That's quoting Genesis 18 verse 10. And I want you to, to pay close attention. We're in, we're in Romans 9. And there is a lot of Old Testament quoting going on by Paul in Romans 9. Why would Paul want to point back to the Old Testament when he's defending God's sovereignty and God's election? Why would Paul want to, why would someone like Paul want to point backwards to the Old Testament to help make the argument about God's sovereignty and God's choosing and God's election? That's what they studied. That's what they, stu that's what they knew. That's what they knew. That's what they studied. Mm -hmm. 
It would also show that this is nothing new. This is the same sovereign God who did these things all the way back in Genesis, right? He chose. He chose to fulfill that promise in Isaac. He chose to love Jacob and hate Esau. This is the same God, same characteristics, same everything, right? So if I'm telling you about Christianity, the fulfillment of God's Old Testament promises, but to you it's going to sound like this is a new religion, but it's really not. It's really the fulfillment of what you've been told all along. To be able to do that, I'm going to reference as much Old Testament as possible so that you see that what I'm talking about in and through Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of everything that's been told to you and taught to you from Genesis through today. That is exactly why he's doing this. So he quotes Genesis 18.10 here. Isn't that interesting? So that's verse 9. Verse 10. Uh, well, I asked the question, what did God do? Why did he do it? Curse it. Well, this is go verse, verse at a time. Uh, and not only so, but when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Let's just take verses 10 and 11 there, okay? Um, again, remember, the context here is that Paul is saying God's word has not failed. God's word has not failed. Actually, Jesus Christ and the gospel is the fulfillment of God's word. And so he's using all this for that grand point, okay? And so, but he's also saying some other things here. He's talking about uh, Jacob and Esau, twins, how do, you, how, do you feel, how do you feel that? I mean, when you read those verses, 10 and 11, let me read them again. Not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, they had done nothing, either good or bad. Okay? So at this point, you understand that whatever God is choosing to do here is not because of anything Jacob or Esau did. Because they haven't even been born yet when God made his decision. They haven't been born yet. They have not done anything either good or bad. Then it goes on. So we get that part, right? We understand that nothing's happened yet. So whatever God is about to do, he's not reacting to something that Jacob or Esau did. Because they haven't done anything yet. They haven't been born yet. And so God's not reacting. He's ordaining. So we, we go on in verse 11. In order that God's purpose of election, his purpose of choice, choosing, might continue. And here's the double down. Not because of works. God's election is not the result of works. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. Who's him who calls? God. So when God elects someone, when he chooses to save someone, he is doing it not because of any works they've done, just like Jacob and Esau. They hadn't even been born yet. No works to be done. He's doing it because he has chosen to call, because of him who calls. Does that, does that make sense so far? No. They've done nothing either good or bad. There is no merit or no um, anti merit or demerit to weigh against them right nothing and this is god does not pause time and look fast forward and be like oh look at jacob oh look at esau i'll choose jacob but i'm not going to choose it that this is telling you that's not how god does it god does not go into the future and peer and see what you're going to do that would be him reacting if god paused time or being all-knowing, if God, if God chose to look ahead and, oh, I see that you are going to choose to believe in me, therefore I will save you, that's God reacting. That is not God sovereignly choosing. Huge difference. Huge difference. This tells us that God doesn't look ahead and react to what we do in the future. This tells us that God has already sovereignly decreed. And when he sovereignly decrees on whom he's going to save, it is not based on personal merit. It's not. 
It is his choice, his sovereign plan. Doesn't that make God sound powerful? Uh, yeah, because he is. But that gives all the power to God and none to me. Yes, that's how powerful God is. God has chosen some Jews and some Gentiles, but not all for salvation. But anyone that he chooses is not chosen because of works, but simply because of him who calls. So now, do you and I have any reason to boast? I have no reason to boast. I only love him because he first loved me. I only, I only came to him because he chose me and regenerated me and made it possible for me to come to him. Otherwise, I would have never come to him. How do Arminians handle this scripture? Uh, they don't. <laughs> I mean, do they think, oh, it's just this section? Do they, some will, they some will ignore. It? Some will ignore the clarity and um, push for the foreknowledge, uh -huh. and push that it's God foreknowledge, God's foreknowledge that He's using, and that's what this is referring to. Uh -huh. Although I, I would hope that this shows how clear that it's saying that's not. Why else would would Paul bring up that? before they were even born, right? He doesn't say, um, before they were born, God looked forward. Right? None of that is mentioned. That is never mentioned anywhere in Scripture that God looked ahead with his foreknowledge or with his omniscience and saw how you and I were going to choose him or not choose him. And I, again, this is how I handle the way Arminians look at that. If you want to choose to think that way, you have to overcome the fact that now you're making God reactive, instead of sovereign. And it is quite clear through the context of everything we've read so far, but more than any other chapter in Romans, Romans 9 makes God's sovereignty abundantly clear. You've got you've to you've confront that then. Your and you, react, no, go ahead. Your reactive statement would be a good, I don't want to say comeback, but would be a good response when someone... Yeah, it would be a how... Doesn't that make God reactive? Yeah. If God is looking ahead to see if you and I are choosing him and then basing his decision off of our decision, yeah. it's putting me in control and it's making God react to my decision. Um, I don't see God do that. Like that's not sovereign God. Michael, the other thing, sorry, this is kind of one of the 800 books that Tom bought at yeah. the conference um, was Hard Sayings mm -hmm. by R.C. And this, sure. was, this one is in that. Mm -hmm. I was reading that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's God's salvation then is not, is not attached to human effort. Remember that. God's salvation is not attached to human effort. You're gonna, this is going to get doubled down again. Like just in case that that's not clear, it's going to be made even more clear as we keep going. I mean, even more clear. Pulled up the King James Version just to see if it said election. And it didn't. Say that again. I pulled up the King James Version just to see if it said election. And, and what's it say? It does. It does. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much the same exact person. Yep. Okay, God's salvation is not based on human uh, effort. Effort, thanks. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, why would it be comforting to know that God's salvation is not based on human effort? Because I'd never make it. Because we'd never make it. What's another way of phrasing that same thing? If God's salvation is not based on my effort, can it be kept by my effort? No. It never can it be lost by my effort? Oh, lost. Lost. Can it be kept by my effort? No. no. Can it be gained by my effort? No. Can it be lost by my effort? No. There is an eternal security that is built in to God's salvation. Where you, if you have been saved, you have been saved indeed. Christ will in no way cast you out. If you have genu genuinely come to him, it is because God has made that happen and he will never cast you out. You can't earn it, you can't keep it, you can't lose it because God has done all those things for you. And now you understand why the love for Jesus Christ in a Christian is so strong. It's so strong. Now you understand why believers were willing to go to their deaths without fail, without we wavering because of these promises. That you knew that you knew that you knew that you're saved because... I'm not saved by my effort, I'm not kept saved by my effort, and I can't lose my salvation by my effort. Praise God. We'll go on, because there's so much more. Um, 
verse 12. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Um, That's Genesis 25 that's being quoted there. She was told the older will serve the younger. Now that's opposite of normal, right? Normally it would be the younger who serve the older. This is this is different. This is the opposite. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. How do you how do you like that? How does that make you feel? They haven't been born yet. They haven't been born yet. Um, It might help you to know that the I hated part, it's a verb, of course, but a good rendering of it would be love less. Okay? In our vernacular, when we say hate, we attach a certain certain feeling to that, don't we? But if I say love less, you understand it a little differently, don't you? I think in our vernacular, it would be helpful to view this as Esau, I loved less. Okay? But to a child, that would make me feel like you know, I'm hated. Well, that's why you need to, that's not why you need to expound scripture. This is why you need to read scripture together. And when you read a section like that, you're absolutely right. A kid is going to read that and be like, whoa. Yeah, you need to unpackage that. Adults need that unpackaged. Kids need it unpackaged too, so that they understand what's, you know, I esteem him less, I love him less. God chooses to, um, to love one more than he loves the other. This isn't, a, a, this isn't an emotional hatred. Because hate is very emotional. I yes. I think it's a very emotional word. Yeah, that's why I like the translation. And, and if you go, so if you go into, part of Bible study sometimes is doing that. Going in and looking at the root word, right? When it says hated, then you go in and you find out, you know, what's the original Greek word. And so you go to like a Strong's Strong's book and you go into that and you see what the original root word is and you see that, okay, it means to love less, it means to esteem less. And that helps you get a better grasp of what that word means. Because again, hated is very powerful. And sometimes we have to be careful that the vernacular of our day might not be exactly how it was taken in the original. And so that's why I bring that up here. God has chosen in Jacob and Esau to allow one to experience divine judgment and the other one to experience divine mercy. That is what, that is what the sovereign God has decided. That's what he's decided. Um, this is quoted, the uh, Jacob I loved but Esau I hated is from Malachi 1. This was uh, Malachi looking back at this. And he was looking at it from the perspective of, you have two different nations that came out of Jacob and Esau. You have Israel and you have Edom. And so you have two different nations that came out of this. Nationally speaking, God chose to show more love to the Israelites and less love to the Edomites. This is why, that's why Malachi brings it up, is under that context but it applies here as well. One was loved more, one was loved less, right? God gave his divine mercy to one and chose to not give it to another, sovereignly. So, question five. How do these verses we've read so far illustrate God's sovereignty? What is God? What's it mean that God is sovereign? Never makes a mistake would be perfection or righteousness. What was that? All knowing. All knowing that would be His omniscience. When we say that that God is sovereign, it's ta- so. What's a word that's that is inside sovereign? R e i g n reign. So He fully reigns. To be sovereign is to be in complete control. When we say that God is sovereign, we are literally saying that God is in control and reigns over everything. Everything. That scares some people. Some people don't like that because then when bad things happen, 
they feel like they need to defend God and say, well, God is an all-loving God. And so when these bad things happen, um, you know, it has to be, it can't be because God is allowing it or purposing it, right? So some people don't like the doctrine of sovereignty, but it is all throughout the Bible. But some blame God. Too. Some blame God. Mm -hmm. So, again, I ask, now that you understand what sovereignty means, how do the verses we've read so far illustrate God's sovereignty or his rule over everything? The verses we've read so far, how do they illustrate that? God's sovereign choice as to who he would bless and love and who he would love less and allow to go to divine judgment. Just everything that's been stated about election, wouldn't it? It's God's selection, God's choice. He has the sovereign right as creator to do whatever he wants. He has the sovereign right as creator to do whatever he wants. He is sovereign. We are blessed that our creator is sovereign and that sovereign creator is righteous, holy, and good because he didn't have to save any of us. None of us have a right to be saved. None of us can say to God, you are unjust because it is we who are unjust. It is God who has decided to show in his great mercy to show any mercy at all to beings who are completely unjust. Now, we've mentioned the word election a bunch. I want you to understand what election is. That's why I asked the, the question, what is election? It is God's choice. You can say God's selection, God's choice. I'd throw the word sovereign in there just to remind yourself, hey, it's God's sovereign choice. So when every time you read the word election in the Bible, it's referring to God's sovereign choice. That's why when you hear me pray, sometimes we're praying for somebody's salvation. I say, Lord, may it please you to save blank, right? I am acknowledging that it's his sovereign will whom he will save. May it please you if it be according to your will, right? These are ways that we indicate God's sovereignty and in his power and sovereign rule over all things, he is the one who saves. So, He's the one who gets to choose whom he shall save and who he won't save. All are, all are due divine judgment. In, God's, in his righteousness and justice, all are due divine judgment. In his mercy and love, some are spared from that. How does that doctrine of election make you feel? Does it make you feel all comfortable, all squishy and warm? And, or does it make you uncomfortable? You've heard me say this before. Um, I'm going to read to you a portion of scripture from Luke. This is, this is, and the reason I'm reading this is this is how the natural human heart and the human flesh reacts to God's sovereign election. Okay? This, this, I'll read this story, and when I'm done, you'll see this is how it reacts. This is the natural default reaction to God's sovereignty and election. This is Jesus in Nazareth. And Jesus comes to Nazareth. This is Luke 4, starting in verse 16. Jesus comes to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, the spiritually poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, captives of sin and receiving sight to the blind, the spiritually blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then they began to say, today, or then he say, said to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. 
And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And Jesus said to them, doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Remember when Jesus is on the cross? Why doesn't he take himself down from the cross? And we have heard what you did at Capernaum. Do here in your hometown as well. Hey, you healed people here. Heal them there. Hey, you healed the blind there and you healed the sick there. Heal them here. That's what he's saying. Do it here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but Zarephath and the, in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there are many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Do you see what he's saying there? Jesus said, you're going to tell me, and he prophesied correctly, you're going to tell me, physician, heal yourself. Take yourself off that cross if you're really a prophet and the son of God. And if you're really a prophet and the son of God, you'll heal everybody. You'll hear everybody, because what you've done there in that town, you'll do in this town too. What you've done for this person, you'll do with all people, right? And what does Jesus respond with? Elijah only healed, only helped one widow during that famine, even though there was many people in famine. And Elisha only cleansed one leper, even though there were many lepers at that time. What's, what's Jesus saying? What's he talking about? God chose to only heal one leper in Naaman with Elisha. God chose to only help Zarephath through Elijah. This is examples of God's sovereign election, God's sovereign choice, okay? You follow me so far? Listen to how the people who are in the synagogue who were just, oh, what gracious words come from his mouth. And is this the son of Joseph, right? They were, all, they were all, all for Jesus just a minute ago. Listen to what happens after Jesus tells them God's sovereign election. God will choose some to heal and he will choose others not to heal. Listen to their reaction to the, the principle of God's sovereign election. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him down off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Do you see? When, when people reject the idea of God's sovereign election so vehemently and so aggressively, they are doing exactly what the people in Luke 4, how they responded to Jesus when he brought up God's sovereign election or God's sovereign choice. God chose to heal some people in this town and not other people in this town. God chose to heal Naaman the leper, but nobody else. Does God have the power to heal all of them? Absolutely. Did he choose to? No. What about the widow? He could have helped all the widows. Did he? No, he chose one. This is God's sovereign election. And this tells you that this is what you should expect as the general default reaction so the doctrine of God's sovereign election is wrath, anger, no, rejection of it. No, uh-uh, no, no. But let me just give you some scriptures that, that, that give you more um, proof of God's election or God's choosing. This is John 15, verse 16. John 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask my Father in my name, he may give it to you. You did not choose me. I chose you. Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. Even as he chose us in him. Who chose who? God chose us. Who chose first? God. Even as God chose us in him, before the foundation of the world. When did God do his choosing? When did God enact his sovereign election? Before the foundation of the world. 
before Esau and Jacob were born. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Jacob I loved, Esau I loved less. See? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Not for your dreams, not for, it's for his will and according to his will. In other words, we're not the star in our own story. God is the star in every story. Again, Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That, so this is talking about those that he saves, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Why? According to the purpose of his will. Listen to this. You'll like this one. This is Acts 13, verse 48. Acts 13, verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. So they hear the gospel. They begin rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. The gospel was preached to a large group and as many who were appointed to eternal life as many were chosen, elected, sovereignly. All those who heard that message, who had been elected or chosen by God, they were appointed to eternal life. All those who heard that message believed. And all those who didn't were not elected to eternal life. Get it? 2 Timothy 1.9. 2 Timothy 1.9. God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works. Do you see how that fits in with what we've already talked about? God made his decision about Jacob and Esau long before Jacob and Esau were ever born. We were chosen long before the foundations of the earth, before any works could be done. Okay? And God made his choice before the foundation of the earth. That means he didn't look forward. Okay? He made his choice long before any works. So God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, I didn't earn that calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Jesus Christ before the ages began. This is why God can say that there's a Lamb's book of life, whose names within are all those whom God has predestined to save, which means that everyone, that's why you have the golden chain in Romans 8 that we talked about, if you've, been, if you've been called, if you've been elected, you've been called. If you're going to be called, you're going to be justified. If you're going to be justified, you will be glorified. And the reason why that's the golden chain that can't be broken in Romans 8 is because if God has written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, he wrote it before the foundations of the world. And no one can take your name out of that. So you are guaranteed to be saved. How about John 6, 37? All that the Father will give to me will come to me. All that the Father will give to me will come to me. This is an absolute statement. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. If you are coming to Jesus, it's because the Father has given you to Jesus. You will come. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, so that means the start and the finish are guaranteed. Guaranteed. Because of God's sovereign election. What about one more? Well, yeah. One more. Well, two more. John 6.44. No one can come to me. John 6.44. No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to Jesus. But I just, pre I just gave a bunch of tracks up. None of them are coming to Jesus unless the Father draws them to him. Not a one. I don't care what you say or what you do. God is the one who opens eyes and ears. God is the one who regenerates. No one comes to Jesus in saving faith unless the Father draws them. That's it. And, on, and I will raise him up on the last day, Jesus says. One more. Matthew 22, verse 14. For many are called but few are chosen. Many are called. That is the general call, right? 
The call to repent of your sins and come to faith in Jesus Christ goes out to everyone. That's the general call. But the effectual call can only work for those who have been chosen by God's sovereign election. Now, let's keep going. Question six. Read verses 14 and 15. How does Paul answer those who may object to God's sovereign election? Right? I mean, he knows it's going to come. Let's go through these. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? This is why I asked you, how do you feel about God's election? I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. Maybe you feel it's not fair. Maybe you feel God is unjust. What is, how does Paul answer this? What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Is God unjust? Is God unfair? By no means. Strongest no in the New Testament. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy. I, the sovereign God, creator of all things, will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have mercy compassion Whew. so is is god unjust according to verse 14 no. by no means how can you possibly accuse god of being unjust that takes a, a set of cojones you're gonna call you you wretch you're gonna call god unjust you Viper in a diaper, you sinful person, you, you're going to call the almighty, un, you know, the un, un, unblemished, righteous God who is holy, holy, holy. You're going to call him unjust? I tremble for you. By no means God is unjust. He says to Moses, I'll have mercy, thank you very much, on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion, thank you very much, on whom I will have compassion. God is not unfair. He's, he's quoting Exodus 33 there. You don't think God is fair? You don't think God is just? Here's my answer to that. God is absolutely sovereign and does as he likes. And it does not take away any of his attributes. It does not take away his righteousness, his holiness, his love, his mercy, his grace. His justice doesn't take away from any of that, does it? Who should, if God doesn't deserve to, to, to dictate who receives mercy, who does? You? Me? Sometimes you can turn it around if people are, are having that sentiment and be like, well, who is the one who should deserve, deserve to decide who gets mercy? Who, if it's not God? You? Because you know what you're really saying then. Oh, so you're saying that you're more merciful or you're more just or you're more holy and you're in a better position to be able to dictate who receives mercy and compassion and who doesn't than God? <laughs> I mean, that's not what I'm saying. Well, very good. I'm glad that's not what you're saying. Let's move on, right? Whew. So tell me, I want to hear what you think of this. Is God unjust by no means? Just like he said to Moses, again, he's pointing back to Old Testament, Exodus 33, reminding them that he said to Moses, same God, same God who said this to Moses is the same God who's talking here in Romans, that I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and compassion on whom I will have compassion. How does this make you guys feel? Yeah. Yeah. You could think of it from the, from the standpoint of, of Moses and Pharaoh too, right? Moses and Pharaoh were both murderers, both sinners. Yet one was shown God's grace and one was not, right? Same idea. One was subject to God's judgment and one was kept from it by grace and mercy, not by works, but just by God's sovereignty. Those that think he's unfair are probably not the ones that are chosen. Right. This is emphasizing God's authority over all of his creation. Over all of it. Much of mankind has gotten too big for its britches and thinks too much of itself. Way too much. 
This, in Exodus 33, the, the section of scripture that Paul's quoting there, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion, that's Moses' intercession. Moses goes and intercedes for the people to the Lord. And what does the Lord say? Okay, Moses, you know better than I do. <laughs> no. No. He says, I, I, you found favor in my sight. I will be, but I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will be merciful and compassionate to who I will be merciful and compassionate. So he doesn't give up his sovereign rule and reign, does he? Nope. And he never will. He never will. This is at the same time when he says that, when he's talking up to Moses and he says, I'm going to pass by you. That all happens in that same section of scripture. I'll pass by you, but you can't handle all my glory. I'll let you see a, a slice of a small section of the backside and I'm going to hide you in the cleft of a rock because you can't even really handle that right so I mean at the same time that God is sovereignly pointing out his authority over all creation to Moses I'm going to have mercy and compassion I will be merciful and compassionate but I will choose who I am merciful and compassionate to that's power that's authority and right afterwards he says I'm going to have you stand on this rock and my glory will pass by you Again, showing just how sovereign and glorious and powerful God really is. That's all very purposefully brought back to mind here by Paul in Romans 9. What about uh, question 7? What is the it mentioned in verse 16 and what does this teach us about salvation? This is verse 16. Very important verse when it comes to um, election and salvation. Verse 16 says this. So then... It depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So, what's the it? So then it depends not on human will or exertion. What's the it? Salvation. salvation. So then salvation depends not on human will or exertion, but on who? God who has mercy. Even faith is a gift from God. We see that in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Faith is a gift. Grace is a gift. Salvation is a gift. It is not initiated by human will. It is not initiated by human choice. In other words, when it says, so then it depends not on human will or exertion. There is no human who has not been, let's, say that we have, let's take a human who has not been regenerated by God. God has not moved in them one bit. They are in their sinful state with God not moving in them one iota. Okay? That person, out of the blue, um, hears a sermon and says, Well, I'm, you know, I don't really, I'm going to make myself want to be saved. I'm going to make myself want to be drawn to God. I'm going to, through my sheer will and exertion of force and works, I'm going to make my way to God. Doesn't that sound silly? Mm -hmm. that'd, be like, that'd be like me saying, I, through my sheer willpower and exertion, am going to climb the ladder to heaven. I can't do it. I don't know. Like, you know, when Jacob is dreaming of the ladder, I don't know where that ladder is. Was that just, you know, where is it? How do I get there? How do I climb up? Do I have the stamina? How far does it go? Right? I can't do any of these things. It does not depend on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. What does that teach you about salvation? Who, who initiates salvation? God. God. And you know what I think of? Hmm. Ask Jesus into my heart. Yeah, ask Jesus into your heart. I found Jesus. Yeah. No, you didn't. Hmm. That is... That is that is a, a, a scripturally inaccurate statement. Jesus found you. Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve sinned and they went running to God. God, we sinned and we're so... No, they ran from God. Paul ran to Jesus on the road to Damascus and said, God, please save me. Jesus, please... No. Jesus came to him, right? That's the, that's the MO. We don't run to God. God runs to us, right? Who's the initiator? God. Is that... For every single believer? Yes. yes. This is why, this is one of, this is one of the, the preeminent teachings of the Reformed faith, that 
regeneration precedes faith, okay? If anybody ever says to you, what's the difference between, you know, what you guys teach and what I might hear in a different church? You can point out the five solas. You can point out the doctrines of grace. You can point out the ordo salutis. And you can also point out, you can point out things too, like, you know, the idea of, of the reformed theology is that's reforming something that was deformed. The church went away from the scripture. We're, we're reforming it around the scripture again. But you can also say this very important statement, and this sets us apart from most churches, that regeneration comes before faith in Jesus. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John 3, and he's talking about the work of the Spirit and how you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, how, what, how, can I crawl back into my mother's womb? I don't know, what are you talking about? How am I supposed to be able to do this? And Jesus' response to that is that you don't do it. It's the Spirit's work. And this is telling us the same thing. We read some other verses about election, right? In John 6, 44, no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him, right? So you're not going to come to Jesus until God has already initiated. He just all affirmed that we all believe that God's the initiator, right? He's the initiator. It's he who makes it possible for us to be saved. It's he that makes it possible for us to have faith. God's the one. So then, if that is true, that means that God must first act for us to come to faith, which is why we believe with all our heart and with all of Scripture that regeneration, God's work in you and I, comes first, and then you and I come to faith. Most churches teach the opposite. Most churches say, you need to ask Jesus into your heart, and then he will come in, and he will regenerate you, and he will change you, and he will... That is not what Scripture says, is it? It is that God initiates, God acts, God draws, and then we come to Jesus. Any questions about verse 16? Well, when you said regeneration, my brain is stopped and I'm like, what is regeneration? Mm -hmm. I look at that, it's rebirth. Rebirth, rebirth, uh, reborn, um, the stirring in your heart. Um, so in, right. Well, so the order of salutis, which means the order of salvation in Latin, okay, this is a very useful tool because it puts terms to the different, to the way that God saves, right? So he elects, and this happens before creation, God elected. He chose in his sovereignty whom he was going to have mercy on and whom he wasn't. That was election. And then calling is when he calls people to himself. Right? So that can happen at any time in a person's life. He can call. He can call when you're very young. He can call when you're very old. But he calls. And he only calls those he's elected. So then he calls them. When he calls someone, regeneration is when he is when he begins to impart spiritual life. This he called you, and now all of a sudden, uh, you know, I just I'm, I'm curious about what the Bible says. I want to hear more about this Jesus. I, I, I want to know more, right? I'm now interested in things I was never interested in before. That's regeneration. That's the new, that's the new, he is, he is rewiring you, right? And then the conversion is when you respond to what you've learned from this. When he has stirred your heart, when he's dipped his finger in your heart, and he's gone like this, this is the drawing, right? No one can come to Jesus unless God the Father draws him. That's the drawing. That's the drawing. And when you finally have that moment of faith. This is the drawing, and in between, this line right here, in between the drawing, and when you actually have that real, genuine faith, you're converted. That's when this happens. And then all this happens at once. The minute you have faith, that first moment you have faith, you're converted. You're changed. And then when you are, this is your conversion, is your positive response to the gospel of Christ. So your first response to faith your genuine response to faith is conversion. At the moment of conversion, the moment you have genuine faith for the first time, you are immediately justified. Immediately. Fully at that moment. It is not a process. It is a one and done. It's done. You have been justified. You are now fully paid off on God's ledger because of Christ. So you are fully saved at this point. The legal action has been completed. 
you are saved, you are justified, you are made right with God. That happens at the exact moment of conversion. What also happens at the exact moment of conversion is the adoption. You're immediately adopted into the family of God. All the promises, all the everything are now yours. They're all yours. All three of these happen at the same time. And then you have sanctification. That's that dirty work zone, right, where God is now setting you apart for himself. He's making you more into Christ's likeness day by day by day. And then he's going to preserve you the whole time. You can't be taken out of his hand, even by yourself. That's what we read in Romans 8, right? Neither death nor height. Nothing in all of creation can take or can do away with the love that Christ has for us. That's, that's perseverance. God will make sure that, that all of this leads to this. Not you. You don't make it happen. God makes it happen. Just all this is telling you that God's in charge of it all. So you can trust him and you don't have any reason or to doubt or fear. So everything ends in glorification. So everyone who's been elected will be called, they will be regenerated, they will be converted, they will be justified, adopted, sanctified, they will be persevering, and they will be all glorified. That's the, that's the when you, when God removes all sin from us, when we die or he comes back, which after whichever happens first. That's all guaranteed. If you're, if you're here, you will be there. If, you, if you're here, or here, or here, you, you, you've been here. These are all guarantees, every single one. And it helps to have that terminology because maybe in your own life it helps you to identify where you've been and where you're at, but it also helps with others. It helps with others. If somebody has been justified, they're going to show signs of sanctification. If they don't show any signs of sanctification, then you have a right to be suspicious that perhaps justification hasn't happened. And perhaps, perhaps they have been, maybe they have been elected, but they haven't been called yet. There's a lot more to go over. I think we'll end here for tonight.